Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of August 6th, 2018. The weekly top three is a regular segment on the Michael Duke Show. I join Michael on the show each Tuesday morning from 9.15 to 10 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 9 to 11 a.m. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, and SoundCloud pages, and on my website at bgkeefley.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, what the real PFD number would have been had the legislature followed the PFD statute. Second, our view on Mark Begich's evolving PFD plan. And third, our problems with Mead Treadwell's economic plan. And now, let's join Michael. Brad Keefley joins us every week to discuss oil, gas, and the economic forecast of Alaska. It's the Michael Dukes Show. Every week, Brad Keefley from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets comes on the program and he and I get a chance to talk about what is going on in Alaska, specifically down in the budget area, and how it affects us. This morning's with our weekly top three, we're going to focus on the big one, which, of course, is how much was our PFD? How much was it supposed to be? How badly in this age of SB 91 did we get robbed by the legislature? Brad Keithley joins us this morning. Good morning, sir. Michael, good morning. How are you today? Well, I'm okay. I'm a little, I'm a little uh, concerned, a little frustrated. A lot of different things happening, uh, and I'm a little agitated. As I said earlier, I might need a stiff drink and some blood pressure medication after this segment uh, because you're about to bust us down on what exactly happened with the permanent fund and how badly we just got skewered this uh, this last uh, session. Uh, let's let's kick things off with that. Sure. Uh, so the Permanent Fund Corporation came out at the end of July with its fiscal report for FY 2018 uh, and the earnings that uh, the, the Permanent Fund Corporation generated or the Permanent Fund generated over the course of fiscal year uh, 2018. And that's a key ingredient in calculating the permanent, uh, the permanent fund dividend each year, according to the statute, uh, each year uh, you take the, the last five years and average them out uh, for the earnings, and then uh, use that in the calculation of the permanent fund dividend. So you need to know the latest year's earnings before you can actually do uh, the dividend calculation each year. Up until July 31st, the permanent fund corporation had been estimating that uh, they'd estimated a range uh, of earnings. The midpoint of that range was 4.3 uh, billion dollars in earnings on the permanent fund. Um, and if you if you put that into the into the equation required by the statute, that resulted in a PFD of somewhere in the neighborhood of twenty seven hundred dollars. And frankly, that's what most people used during this past session as what the PFD would have been uh, had it not been uh, messed with, taxed, cut uh, by the by the legislature. Uh, but but surprisingly, when the when the final earnings came out. Uh, the Permanent Fund Corporation reported earnings not of $4.3 billion, which was the midpoint, not $5.3 billion, which they had been reporting as the upper end of the possible range, but they reported FY 2018 earnings of $6.3 billion, $2 billion <laughs> higher, 50% higher than, uh, than what they've been estimating up to that point. And that changes that changes the calculation significantly. If one of mm. your of one of your five <laughs> is six point three instead of four point three, it comes in to be a different number. So, going through the formula and uh, and there's one other key assumption in this that you have to make, and that's how many recipients of the permanent fund there are going to be. 
that's the divisor into the into the earnings number. Um, assuming that the recipients stay roughly the same number as last year, and there's some evidence it may be less, maybe fewer, but but assuming it stays the same, that comes out to a permanent fund dividend per man, woman, and child of three thousand twenty nine dollars, um, which is which is a hell of a lot bigger. <laughs> than the $2,700, I think, that people have been assuming um, up to that point. I just got robbed so hard, so hard. I mean, I just, my family just lost about 9000 bucks in one year. Boom, just like that. Have a nice day. I mean, that's that's crazy. It, it is. It is. I mean, so, so the 1600 presumably was set, the 1600 the legislature set, in the appropriation process, presumably was set with some reference to the $2,700, right? It was presumably people said, well, instead of the $2,700 we should get, we're going to give them $1,600 right. um, and, and, and sort of balance things out in that fashion and then looked at what was left over, uh, what, what was cut and what would go to government from that. So instead of, instead of that $1,100 difference, we were going to get 16. They were going to cut us by uh, 1,100. When you look at the actual final earnings that come out for the year and run through the calculation, the difference is $1,400. Uh, almost, they, they've cut the, the, the PFD that they're going to pay, the $1,600 that the legislature passed, is now barely 55%, just a little bit over 50% of what it would have been had, uh, had they observed the statute or complied with the statute. So it's uh, this this sort of surprise at the end in terms of earnings affects a lot of things. It affects what the PFD actually should have been. It affects the thought process, I think. It affects the thought process that people were going through uh, during the session. And, and it's, uh, it, it's, it's, signif- it's a significant enough change that I really have the question in my mind of, what did what did the permanent fund corporation know, and when did they know it? When did they know that we were going to overshoot earnings, uh, their earnings projections by by you know fifty percent from what they were projecting for uh, for the fid point uh, for, for the midpoint? Because if they knew it early on, if they knew it during session, if they could see the trend, and there's some there's some indication they could, if you could see the trend going in that direction, then shouldn't you have told? The legislature, and shouldn't you have told Alaskans that instead of the twenty-seven hundred dollars everybody was assuming it was going to be over three thousand um, dollars? So it, 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 this, to me, raises a number of questions. Well, I'm a little torn on this, Brad. For I mean, let me let me go both ways on this uh, because first of all, I'm a little glad that she didn't know because they may have actually taken more at that point. We would have been happy just you know you were going to get a three thousand dollars. But on the other hand, Rodell has made some comments about, uh, you know, that have hinted at being OK with the government taking more and more of that money. I'm a little I'm a little concerned either way uh, that they would have either tried to take more based on the fact that it was going to be a larger dividend or uh, that they would have, uh, you know, that, I, that they I'm just a little concerned. I guess I'll put it that way. I, I don't I don't see any way out of this with the current crop of uh of uh, of of caged animals that we have right now down in Juneau. Well, you got to understand, Stan, Michael, that, that the way SB twenty six worked out, um, SB twenty three, SB twenty, whichever number I'm supposed to remember at this point. But the, the way the way the the legislature worked out their fiscal fix uh, and using POMV, um, this earnings bump uh, and and the way it's affected the the way it affects the uh, the value of the permanent fund overall uh, increases the amount that in, is going to increase the amount that goes to government, but it has but but by fixing the PFD at sixteen hundred dollars, they've essentially you know shoved more of that money over to government as opposed to as opposed to sharing it uh, with citizens. It, it's um the, the the lack of information during the session. If we're going to get into a situation as as we are where we're going to start looking at the permanent fund earnings and and draws from the permanent fund earnings reserve as a means of financing government. And if we're going to start looking at it as a balance between what should go to Alaskans and what should go to government, we're going to need much more, much better information much earlier in the process 
than than what this has than than what this episode has has shown us. But 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 at at its, at base, if the statute had been applied, if if we hadn't started, if the legislature and the governor hadn't started mucking around with the permanent fund, if Governor Hammond's original vision for the permanent fund and the statute as it still exists had been enforced, we would have had a permanent fund dividend for every man, woman, and child of over $3,000. That's certainly a record, and certainly during a recession, uh, something that, that would have been, that, that would be uh, uh, fairly significant in terms of its impact on the overall Alaska economy. Well, and that's the biggest thing. See, that's the that's the biggest thing. Now look and and regress these numbers out as far as what would that money have done for the economy? Uh, because, I mean, again, we're talking about my family alone, nearly nine thousand uh, dollars in monies that we could have used for, you know, paying off loans or buying utilities or, or or circulating that money. You know, I mean, things that my family needs, but, you know, we haven't been able to get lately because of my employment status and everything else. I would have been able to say, hey, we could get caught up. We could do all this stuff and it would have been great. But now we're just going to have to kind of try and limp along as best we can. Uh, what is everybody else doing? Uh, you know, what is everybody else? Well, uh, how are they making it through? What's it doing in the long term to the economy? Yeah, exactly. I mean, the the PFD has the largest positive impact uh, on the overall Alaska economy, uh, has the largest positive impact on jobs of any government spending. I mean, that's been true since Governor Hammond's day. The ICER study in, in 2016 showed it continues to be true. Um, and so the, the multiplier effect of putting that money into the economy, what Governor Hammond called trickle up, uh, putting that money in the hands of Alaskans and letting them make the decision of where that goes uh, in the economy, the economic multiplier of that would have been would have been significant. We're talking about uh, uh, something in the range of oh, if, if the statute had been enforced, something in the range of 2.5 billion of of additional impact um, into the economy. Cutting it, on the other hand, I mean the the flip side of that is cutting it has the largest adverse impact on the overall economy, uh, and the largest and, and is by far the costliest to Alaska families of all of the revenue solutions uh, that the state could do. So we have, we have hurt the Alaska economy. The legislature and the governor, by signing the bill, uh, have hurt the overall Alaska economy and have hurt Alaska families much more deeply through this measure, through cutting the PFD, than they could have by any of the other revenue measures uh, that they could have adopted. So it's, I, I mean, at a time of recession, uh, uh, taking a step of, of cutting the PFD this dramatically, I mean, we're cutting at 45%, nearly 50%, cutting the PFD this dramatically uh, is hurting uh, middle income and lower income Alaska families in a way that we shouldn't be. Uh, and and to, a, to an extent, and, and we're hurting the overall Alaska economy to an extent uh, that we shouldn't be. There are better options that we that we could pursue. So it's a, I mean, it's sort of a stunner. This three thousand dollars is 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 a stunner to me. That's a, that's a that's a number that is significant. I mean, we've we've had legislators talk about oh, the BFDs historically sixteen hundred dollars. We shouldn't you know cut a little cut here, a little cut there, and we're giving you sixteen hundred dollars this year. Well, Hammond always envisioned, and the founders always envisioned, that it would rise and it would become an increasingly significant factor in the overall Alaska economy. It would help, through trickle-up, it would help build the Alaska economy. At the time that we're finally reaching the level where these PFD numbers are significant, all of a sudden the state wants to convert that money to its, to its, own, its own pocket, take it out of the pocket of Alaskans, uh, and, and redirect it from Juneau as opposed to letting individual Alaskans uh, make that decision. So right at the time we're getting into the, in, into the period that I think Governor Hammond and others envisioned where the PFD would become a significant factor in the overall Alaska economy or an even bigger factor in the overall Alaska economy, government's ripping it out of Alaskans' hands and, 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 and now running it out of Juneau.
And yet there are politicians. We're talking, by the way, with Brad Keithley uh, for Alaskans for a Sustainable Budget. You can find links to his uh, his Facebook page and to him as a person up there at the top of the Facebook post for the video this morning. Um, but there are people out there, Brad, who are saying, oh, we, we, it's not a tax. We, we didn't tax. We stood against taxes. And then you have others that justify it. Ivy Sponholtz is one. Uh, no, I'm sorry. Von Imhoff is one who basically said, well, we had to do it to protect all the money from leaving Alaska. We had to protect those high income earners because they were going to leave, says the high income earner. Uh, we had to protect that, and so we're going to tax all the plebeians out there, and they're going to feel it. But, of course, the high-income earners won't feel it now. I mean, she actually – not all the plebeian stuff, but she actually said to protect the wealthy in the state of Alaska, this is what we've got to do to keep them from leaving. Yeah, it's I, it's fascinating. I mean, a much better fiscal policy, a much better approach if, if, if we're going to have to have new revenues – and since we can't get the legislature to cut spending any deeper and we can't get the governor to cut spending any deeper, we need new revenues. If we're going to have to have new revenues, a much better approach would be a flat tax. Everybody would pay a given percentage uh, of their income. But rather than do that, the same percentage of their income, so it would affect high income earners the same way it would affect middle income earners and low income earners uh, as a percent of income. But rather than do that, rather than be essentially neutral across all the income classes, uh, what the legislature has done instead is, is do PFD cuts. And PFD cuts, let's, let's, not get, let's not get confused about this. PFD cuts is taking income out of the pockets of Alaskans, and by the way, only Alaskans, taking income out of the pockets of Alaskans and moving it to government. That is a tax. The economic definition of a tax is an involuntary transfer of income from from citizens and corporations to government. Well, the, the the statute set what the amount of income coming from the permanent fund earnings is supposed to be to individual Alaskans. The legislature through the through the through a bill is cutting that and diverting a portion of that to to government. That and, and it sure as heck isn't voluntary. Right. So that meets the economic de- definition of a tax. So. What, what, what the legislature is doing is taxing, burdening middle and lower income Alaskans much more on a percentage basis than upper income Alaskans to, to fund government. They're taking it out of the highs. They're funding government off the backs of middle and lower income Alaskans. Yeah, Senator Von Inhoff says, oh, you know, health care costs are so high. If we add taxes on top of that, people with money are going to leave. Well, what do you think middle and lower income Alaskans are doing? They're bearing health care costs also. And so somehow, and, and, and so it, in this process, essentially what we're doing, when you boil through all of it and look at the economics of it, essentially what we're doing is we're having middle and lower income Alaskans subsidize higher income Alaskans by those that, by, by higher income Alaskans not having to pay a proportionate share of the cost of government and forcing a disproportionate share of the cost of government over on middle and lower income Alaskans. It is the most ridiculous economic policy you possibly can come up with, especially during a recession, and especially with a program that the economists have told you has the biggest bang for the buck in the overall economy and is by far the the, the, the best program for Alaska families. To cut that in the middle of a recession in order to protect high-income earners from having to pay even a proportionate share of the cost of government, it's just a ridiculous economic policy. It is a, it is a, for lack of a better word, it's a let them eat cake economic <laughs> policy. We've got ours. We're going to protect ours. The rest of you, you guys have to pay. Middle and lower income, you have to pay. Yes, the Ala- overall Alaska economy is going to take a bigger hit than under under any other program. And yes, Alaska families are going to be worse off. But that's, you know, we've got the power and we're going to do it. That's just its a ridiculous economic policy. Well, you forgot, Brad, the one thing it is, it's also the easiest. Easiest from their perspective of protecting their donor base, making sure that they and their friends in the top 20% income earners don't get hit, and easiest because they don't have to make those hard choices in cutting government and picking the winners and losers. That is, that is the thing. It is the easiest at this point. Brad Keithley is our guest from yeah. Alaskans for a Sustainable Budget. Brad, go ahead. Well, yeah, exactly. They they have drained 
the, the, the statutory budget reserve. The legislature strained the, drained the statutory budget reserve. We had about three to three to five billion dollars in that. They've now come very close to draining the constitutional budget reserve, which had about twelve to thirteen billion dollars in it. Um, and now they're just looking at the PFD, at the permanent fund thirty uh, permanent fund earnings, as the third piggy bank, right? We've, we've, we've broken into and we've drained the first two piggy banks, the SBR and the CBR, and now we're just going to start draining the, uh, draining the permanent fund dividend. But the problem with that is, is we're in a recession. It has the largest adverse impact on the overall economy. It is by far the costliest to Alaska families. It disproportionately taxes middle income and lower income Alaskans. Uh, at the at in order to essentially subsidize higher income Alaskans, it is it is, it may be the easiest because the piggy bank sitting there and all they got to do is pass a bill to divert that money, divert the the flow from 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 being to individuals over to government. Maybe the easiest, but it's the worst uh, in terms of its impact uh, on the overall Alaska economy and on Alaska families. Uh, you listeners will have to decide how badly this affects you and your family. Again, just take each and every one of your 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 uh, uh, you know your spouses and your dependents and multiply it uh, times fourteen hundred and twenty nine dollars. That is exactly how much you got hit for this last year, and it's devastating uh, for Brad Keithley's uh, top one of the top three for this week. Brad Keithley's our guest, Alaskans for a Sustainable Budget. Brad, let's jump into, uh, now that we've gotten taken the, the really, really bad news, the turd sandwich, let's talk about some of the potential solutions that are being offered by some of the candidates for governor. Specifically, uh, we'll kick things off with Mark Begich, who at first I thought was all about keeping the dividend at the, uh, at the right level, at the statutory level, and now I see that there appears to be, in my mind, and maybe you could explain this to me from your perspective, but what appears to be some hedging. Uh, from baggage on this. There's some different verbiage in there that I'm having a hard time reconciling uh, on his new plan for protecting the PFD while investing in Alaska. Yeah, there's there's been an evolution in what in what uh, baggage has said about the about the PFD. He wrote a uh, an editorial in February uh, that appeared in the Anchorage Daily News that was sort of the kickoff of his refocus on state issues and the headline of it was fortify the fund protect the dividend and support schools and basically it was a proposal it was his proposal to um, uh, uh, maintain the, the permanent fund use 40 50 percent of the earnings going to the permanent fund use 40 percent for education to help fund education take that burden away from the from unrestricted general funds and put it over on the permanent fund earnings, and then leave 10% for uh, inflation proofing. There, there were there were problems with that formula. He wasn't putting enough aside for inflation proofing, um, but but it was clear in, to me and to others in that editorial that he was talking about maintaining uh, the current permanent fund approach, permanent fund dividend approach. It said 50% of permanent as as part of my proposed permanent PFD protection plan, the state would allocate 50% of the permanent fund annual earnings to the individual PFD. This would likely mean Alaskans would be guaranteed a PFD of between $1,500 and $1,800 each year. The key to that is 50% of the permanent fund annual earnings to the individual PFD. That's the way the current statute is written, and and I took it and others took it as meaning he was – he was endorsing the current statutory approach and talking about constitutionalizing it. Now, with it, with with his with his announcement that he's running, he, he's he's gotten his website up, and it has a portion of the website uh, talks about priorities. And the first priority is protecting the promise of the PFD while investing in Alaska. And when you look at the details of the proposal. It's no longer an earnings, 50% of the earnings of the PFD. Right. Rather, what he's now talking about using is a POMB approach, using 50% of a POMB formula for a sustainable dividends for Alaskans. We've talked on the show before about the difference between earnings and POMB. POMB is just a percentage draw from the from, off the permanent fund. It's not tied to what the earnings are each year. Uh, it's just the percent of the value uh, of the fund. 
and is a different way of structuring it. Um, and so that approach, uh, uh, frankly, it depends upon what level, what, what percentage uh, you use, but that approach will result in a somewhat lower uh, permanent fund dividend than the current earnings approach. So uh, it, it's sort of, you, you could say, when you talk about baggage, there was the old baggage proposal, and now there's the new baggage proposal, <laughs> um, and 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 it's evolved between the two, right? Uh, to, to 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 lessen the dividend and and uh, and and push more, uh, uh, well, leave, leave more in the permanent fund basically and lessen the dividend. Well, and there's this this uh, proposal that he puts out here on his website is pretty light on details, but one of the things that I note that if he utilizes a POMV formula instead of an earnings formula, it also does not have the classic rise as the earnings, as the fund grows, the main portion of the corpus grows. And, of course, the more it grows, the more revenue it generates. It's that money ball that, that you know, that, that uh, people talk about with your savings account, so to speak. The more you have, the more you can earn, even at a static amount of return. And so it basically does away with any kind of real potential increase for years to come. I mean, it would lock it into that sixteen, eighteen hundred dollars a year uh, component based on a POMV formula if they left that static POMV number alone, and the increase in those escalators would go away. And that is, I mean, that that hurts. Well, that's not exactly that's not exactly right, Michael. So POMV is tied to the overall value of the fund. So if the fund is, and let's say we use a five percent return, if the fund is fifty billion dollars, then the then the then a five percent POMV is two point five billion dollars. As the fund grows to sixty billion dollars, that that five percent POMV goes to th- grows to three billion dollars. And it, at seventy billion dollars, just to sort of give one other point on it, it, it would grow to three point five billion dollars. So it grows um, uh, as the as the value of the fund grows. Uh, it doesn't. What what we have under the current system is we have an earnings based system. So uh, it's the last five years of earnings. If you have a strong five years of earnings, you have a high PFD. If you have a low five years of earnings, you have a low PFD. The 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 it's tied to earnings as opposed to being tied to the overall market value of the fund. But a POMB a POMB nevertheless does a ju- does produce more uh, revenues. Uh, as the as the as the value of the fund grows, but but it it wouldn't be as much. I mean, yes, you have the highs and the lows with the earnings side, but it's not as high a rate of return, is it? I mean, and I haven't penciled this out, but I, I looks to me like you consistently get a lower return on the POMV side. Am I wrong? Excellent point, and and that relates to what POMV number you use. The history, the real, what you're trying to do with a POMV number is you're trying to get what economists call to the real rate of return, the after-inflation rate of return right. that you're earning off of your off of your investment. And the and the permanent fund has done a pretty good job. His, over the course of its history, taking all all the years since since the late 1970s when the permanent fund was established, the permanent fund has 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 had a real rate of return of around 6.3%. So if you use a 5% real rate of return you're as, or a 5% POMV, you're going to undershoot the actual real rate of return that the, that the permanent fund has earned over time. If you use, if you use the, the, the actual real rate of return, the 6.3%, then the earnings approach and the POMV pro- approach should come out uh, roughly the same. There's going to be timing differences, but they should come out roughly the same. But when you use a 5% POMV approach, and that looks to be – Begich doesn't have what his number, his POMV number is on the website. But that, from, from what he's saying about what his dividend would be, it looks to be like a 5% number. If you look at that, if you use a 5% number, you are going to undershoot what the actual real rate of return has been over time out of the permanent fund, and you are going to undershoot. Uh, what uh, an earnings-based uh, approach would do. And that, again, is my main concern here because the true value, as Hammond intended, for, again, that trickle-up of Alaskans having access to their own wealth, 
that really it shortchanges Alaskans and whether it's a thousand or fourteen hundred or whatever it is year after year after year, that compounding effect is going to be detrimental to the private economy and to the overall economy of the state in the long run. It is. It is. You can. You can. I, I've. I've said in the past that you can develop a POMV system that is as good as an earnings-based system, and it would have certain advantages over an earnings-based system. But that, you've, you've got to base it on your actual realized real rate of return as opposed to some artificial lower uh, rate of return. If you use an, art, uh, an artificially low number, then, then we are going to shortchange the Alaska economy. If you use a realistic and overall rate of return, uh, real rate of return that the fund's generating, then it, a POMB sort of smooths out. Uh, uh, you know, you can go up with earnings, down with earnings. A POMB better smooths out some of those ups and downs. Um, but you've got to. But but in order for it to generate the same amount uh, as an earnings-based system, you've got to have. You got to be using the, the 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 actual real overall rate of return uh, that that uh, that the funds generated. And it doesn't. I mean, that's a debate we need if we're going to go to POMB. That's a debate we need to have, uh, and a debate, frankly, we've not had. What's the right number? Uh, for, for obvious reasons, the Permanent Fund Corporation wants a low number because it's sort of a hedge for them against having, you know, against making mistakes. So if you say, look, you guys have earned 6.3 historically, um, and so we're going to assume you're going to continue to be able to do that, uh, and we're going to base draws on that. Uh, if the if the permanent fund corporation comes in and has a, a, a series of lower returns than that, they're going to be criticized for not having lived up to uh, lived up to the the historical average. So they'll want a low. The permanent fund corporation will want a low number, really to lower the bar of what it is people are expecting from them. And and when the per, I sort of chuckled when they've gone up to the legislature and the permanent fund corporation says, well, we ought to have a ret- we ought to use a, a a uh, POMV of about 5%. Well, yeah, sure. If I was in your position, I'd say the same thing. But that's not being fair to Alaskans, and that's not being fair to the overall Alaska economy. We, the, permanent fund corporate, the permanent fund is there to generate earnings uh, uh, in part to fund the PFD. And so we ought to use the full set of earnings that are being generated – um, uh, as 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 we go along, in order to have that trickle up effect on the Alaska economy, so there's a whole debate to have about the POMV number, um, uh, and and it looks like when as as Begich slid, slid from an earnings based approach over to his POMV based approach, he sort of incorporated a lower number that results in a lower effect uh, on the on a, a lower PFD. Uh, and a lower effect on the overall Alaska economy. That's an issue that, frankly, as you say, as we get into the weeds, we need to dig into deeply because because it is it's it's penalizing Alaska families and it's penalizing the overall Alaska economy. So that being said, and now that he voted for it before he voted against it, or however else you want to phrase this, uh, your previous analysis of the gubernatorial election was we had two candidates that were for a fully funded PFD and one who was against as far as in the major players. And now I don't think that that necessarily plays out. Do you? I mean, is that now we now kind of split with one in the middle? Yeah, exactly. So Charles Wolfers wrote a column uh, where this whole thing about Begich's approach sort of first surfaced. And and I think Wolfers, looking now at Begich's, um, uh, evolved position. Uh, I think uh, uh, Wolfers had it right. He essentially says you've got Governor Walker who doesn't believe in 50 uh, 50 and who is, has signed off on bills that would cut the PFD to 25% of earnings or 25% of the revenue flow from a, from a, from a POMV. You've got uh, 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 Dunleavy, who's out, Senator Dunleavy, who's out there arguing for a full statutory PFD, keep it the way we've always done it, earnings-based approach that produces, uh, as we said, would produce this year a $3,000 plus um, uh, PFD. And now you've got Begich, who's, who's evolved into this POMB approach, still 50-50, as, as Dunleavy has, different from Walker, still 50-50, but POMB-based and, and based at a, at a fairly low POMB number. So, yeah, you've got you've now got a spread. You don't have 
you don't have Dunleavy and Begich asserting one thing and Walker the other. You've got a spread between Walker on the low side, Begich. Hmm, depending upon the POE, POMB number you use, sort of sort of below the middle, and then uh, Dunleavy back up at the uh, at the historic. Uh, earnings level for the uh, earnings based approach for the PFD. Let's put your pundit hat on for a second. Do you think that that's intentional? Do you think that this is Begich trying to to isolate himself and split himself off from Dunleavy on this specific topic, or is it more a philosophy of size and scope of government spending in his in 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 his mind? I you know in all honesty, I think Mark's been convinced to go to POMB uh, because it is a it, it, the permanent fund corporation would like it better. It's a smoother approach. And frankly, I think using 5% was more a knee jerk reaction than a thoughtful reaction. I, I, I could be wrong, but, but I, I, I think he sort of stumbled into this position once he clicked over to POMV as opposed to thoughtfully going through saying, I'm going to have it at 5%. Um, and I think it hurts him. I mean, in a general election, uh, he's going to, he's going to look better compared to Walker in terms of being concerned about the overall Alaska economy and Alaska citizens and Alaska families, but he's still not going to—he's not going to look as good as Dunleavy. So I think, I think this 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 evolved position tilts the balance uh, for those who care for those who look at the BFD uh, tilts the balance more toward Dunleavy going into the general election. If I were if I were Begich, I wouldn't have done it this way. He has, so you have to sort of have accepted. But I wouldn't have done it this way. I think it, I think it positions him less well uh, going into the general election than where he was going based upon his February uh, editorial. Well, and seeing that the PFD is really the number two issue behind crime in the state right now as far as uh, political issues for this upcoming election, I can definitely see how, uh, how, how that is going to probably hurt him in the long run. Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Uh, he's the founder and director of that. You can find him out on Facebook. We've got links up at the top of the page. Uh, Brad, let's move on to our third of our top three, which is uh, Mead Treadwell's fiscal plan and i use that term you you can't see it but my god i put that in air quotes because um his fiscal plan when i read it looks a lot like here's a wish list of what i'd like to do in the state of alaska this is, again is supposed to be more of a smaller g government kind of republican and what it looks like is he wants government to get involved in a gazillion different projects around the state including taking monies from the permanent fund to invest in these kind of pie in the sky <laughs> delta barley farm projects uh i'm a little concerned about it what what say you well so Mead's been running an investment firm, right? He's been he's running been running PT Capital, uh, which is is an investment fund founded by among others Alice Ro- by among others Alice Rogoff. Uh, but he's been running that, so he's been looking at things from an investment standpoint. And you're right. I think this is I think this article, uh, it's uh, 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 again a uh, editorial in the Anchorage Daily News or an op-ed in the Anchorage Daily News. I think this op-ed is is a wish list. Uh, of investment opportunities, he 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 sees that the Alaska that Alaska should take. Now, let me quickly say that one could argue that that these are investment opportunities that the private sector could take. Right. But the private sector, but the, but the response to that is the private sector hasn't taken them, hasn't seen value in them, hasn't seen a return on them. Um, so, when when you're talking about things that that haven't been done. Uh, you're running for governor, and you're talking about things that haven't been done. Uh, frankly, what you're outlining is things that that you're, you're you're saying you're prepared for government to get into, and in one fashion or another, uh, 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 produce the revenue or, or or have the revenue uh, necessary to invest in these things. What what it's a it's a wish list, but it's it's really it doesn't address the revenue side. So it's we ought to spend more for ports. We ought to spend uh, for a port uh, in Nome. We ought to spend more to bolster the electric system out west in uh, in out west Alaska because then we could do more uh, fish processing in Alaska as opposed to as opposed to it going over to China. Uh, we ought to uh, do something about uh, the uh, Anchorage Airport. 
because we're buying our fuel from Singapore as opposed to buying it from Alaska refiners. Presumably, we need to upgrade Alaska refineries or build more Alaska refinery capacity or something in order to meet uh, that additional demand. But when you come to where's the money going to come from, um, he's got one paragraph in there that, frankly, to me, is just frightening. And the paragraph says, um, oh, I think I just lost it. Is it balancing? Uh, our, the paragraph, I'm sorry, go ahead. Balancing our budget of the assistance? Up. It's at the bottom of the page? Is yeah, that right. The, right. Balancing our budget depends on taking people out. Oh, no. It's, it's yeah, well, basically. Oh, here it is. Uh, economic development means knowing how to be competitive after serving as lieutenant governor and working in the private sector to bring new investment capital to Alaska and the emerging market for the, for the Arctic across the North Slope. Projects worth $13 billion are looking for backing. We send, here it is, we send $100 billion or so in investments around the world with our Alaska Permanent Fund and pension accounts. It's time we ask our global managers to help deals here get financing too. Right. Basically what he's arguing is that we ought to take the permanent fund money and the money about the $25 billion that's in the, the pension fund, the person TERS account, and invest that, uh, at least a portion of that, internally in, in these Alaska projects. The, pro- the problem with – I mean, this goes back to Governor Hammond. Right. The, the problem with that is, is those monies are, in, are, are to be invested to produce the biggest bang for the buck in terms of revenue – uh, for the state in terms of earnings for both the, the, the PERS and TERS and for uh, uh, the permanent fund in order to fund the permanent fund dividend and to fund government. Uh, if you start taking those monies and internalizing them, you're going you're gonna to get politics involved in the game, and people are going to say, oh, this needs to be invested in western Alaska because of all the jobs it's going to produce and, and all of the good things it's going to produce out there. Well, the, the, the problem is it's not going to produce earnings. It may produce some jobs, but it's not going to produce earnings. And so this revenue stream that you're counting on to help, to help deal with PERS and TERS and to help fund permanent fund earnings to help run government and fund the permanent fund dividend, all of a sudden those earnings aren't there anymore because essentially now – we're subsidizing jobs out in western uh, out in western Alaska, or we're sub- subsidizing a new refinery, or we're or we're doing something else with that money, as opposed to generating earnings. There's a there's a big portion of Governor Hammond's book, uh, "Diapering the Devil," that talks about what happened in the early days of the permanent fund or early days of of oil revenues, and he said all these people uh, people in Alaska came up with all these great ideas about. Shouldn't we do this with the money, or shouldn't we do that with the money, or shouldn't we do something else? And it would generate all these jobs, and it would make this local economy so much, so much better. And he said that's how the $900 million from the, from the Prudhoe uh, 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 lease fund uh, disappeared right. because we, we invested in all these things, but they didn't produce earnings. They produced other benefits that helped a small portion of Alaskans. But it didn't produce earnings that produced a benefit for for all Alaskans. And so part of the genesis for creating the permanent fund was to stop that, stop using those funds to sort of subsidize in-state projects and use those funds to generate earnings that benefited all Alaskans. My concern uh, with, with Mead's approach is he takes us back to the bad old days. He takes us back to the days where politicians sort of divvied up the fund uh, to get jobs here, to get jobs there, to get some benefit here or over there for their local economies, but didn't serve the overall, the best interests of the overall state. Um, and the, since the creation of the permanent fund, there's been very few instances when money's been invested by the permanent fund in state. They own their, their own office building. That's about the sole one, sole investment that they've continued to have since the creation of the permanent fund. We've had another uh, uh, corporation, ADA, the uh, Alaska Economic, Import and Economic Development Corporation, that's had a much smaller budget that's sort of done these in-state investments. But the Permanent Fund Corporation and the Pension Fund uh, have stayed away from that. I think it's important they continue to stay away from that, particularly if we're going to count on their earnings, continue to count on their earnings for the Permanent Fund dividend and for uh, government. We need to stay away from investing them in-state. And once you once you take that pot of money away, I think Mead's wish list sort of just 
becomes that, just a wish list that really doesn't have any revenue to support it. Well, there's definitely some things that I want to talk about with this specifically because one, I think it was I think it was in Tales of an Alaskan Bushrat that that Hammond specifically talks about this idea of investing money in Alaska, forcing the investiture of funds in Alaska versus other places. And he talks specifically about how what kind of a boondoggle it is. And I don't have the quote right in front of me, but I know that he he is he's talked about that specifically. But all we have to do is go back to the recent past and look at other investments that the state has tried to push uh, here in the state with state money. I mean, again, I mentioned the Delta Barley Project. We had the Matt, uh, the Matt made dairy. We had I mean, there's just there's project after project that the state thought, oh, this is a great idea. We'll use we'll use public funds to do it. And it just horribly crashed and burned, ended up being a sucking money pit or an abject failure. One of the two. Um, so, I mean, that's already a, a bad track record. Going back to this wish list that Mead has, as you point out, uh, I mean, I'm a libertarian. I'm a free market libertarian, which is is ironic because we really don't have a whole lot of a free market these days. But ideally, if all of these ideas were so fantastic, and Mead points out to a lot of them, and they look good with what he's talking about, but if they looked so good and if they really were truly good, you know, investors, venture capitalists would have jumped all over this. They would have said, hey, here's a great opportunity with a great rate of return. Let's do it. And they haven't done it. And that, to me says exactly all I need to know about what's going on with those things. Because if the private investors don't want to get involved and potentially lose their shirt, why should we insist at the point of a gun that the citizens should get involved with their monies and the potential, of course, of not just losing, uh, you know, losing their dividends, but actually losing portions of the corpus of the fund in issues like that, when, as you said, it's really supposed to be out there to make the maximum yield, regardless of where it goes. That's the mandate is to get the maximum yield for the fund. Um, this whole thing, I mean, I read through this two or three times and I just looked at it and thought, this is where you're at. I mean, I understand you're looking at it through the lens of an investor and everything else. Why don't you have PT Investments jump into all this stuff? Why don't you guys <laughs> suggest that? Why don't you guys get involved in that way? Um, you know, and it's not just getting government out of the way to smooth the waters of regulation or everything else. He's actually advocating to have government take a hand in this kind of stuff, it, which, again, I thought he was a small G Republican. But that's that that just seems to be the new par for the course, unfortunately, for the Republicans, of the GOP in this state. They want to get government involved in areas where historically the GOP has been against government getting involved in. Yeah, they're trying to manage. I mean, this you, you can go back to things like the like the oil and gas tax credits where they wanted to invest uh, or wanted to uh, uh, subsidize oil and gas exploration. There's there's been a long period in Alaska where we've had people who wanted to manage the economy. They wanted to, to direct the economy in certain ways. They want to spur the economy in certain ways. They want to, you know, another one is the is the LNG plant the Interior Energy Project project up in right. up in Fairbanks. They they, they want it. They want to use government money to achieve certain uh, industrial ends. And and the problem, as you absolutely correctly point out, if these things were going to produce earnings, uh, uh, then the private sector would have gotten involved. Basically, they found that the private sector doesn't want to be involved in these things. So we have to take government money. In order to subsidize them, to, to you know, to find the capital uh, to make them go, and 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 Republicans have been as big a part, if not a bigger part, of the problem doing that of trying to have a managed economy uh, as as anybody else. I, you know, we can debate creating incentives. We can debate, uh, you know, relaxing regulations, uh, doing this or that, and 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 trying to incentivize economic activity in that way. That's fine. But when you're talking about taking investments uh, that we're relying on to generate earnings, and let's focus on PERS and TERS, because he includes the retirement funds in that, in that, in that sentence. Right. Let's focus on PERS and TERS. We're counting on PERS and TERS generating returns, earnings, to help us meet the, the long-term retirement obligations that this state's on the hook for. If, if that investment fund doesn't generate earnings, then, then that means we're going to be on the hook for even more 
uh, citizens in the in the future are going to be on the hook for even more uh, annual contributions or in order to cover the earnings that otherwise we're looking to the PERS and TERS investment fund to produce. So taking a portion of PERS and TERS and putting that over in these projects that the private sector's passed on uh, and, and, and putting them in these projects that, that, that don't produce earnings, they produce, may produce other benefits like jobs, but don't produce earnings, we're essentially saying, okay, we're going to take PERS and TERS, we're going to put it over there, it's going to produce jobs, we're not going to have earnings though, and so citizens – the state citizens in the 2020s and 2030s are going to have to pay an income tax. So they're going to have to have their PFD cut to zero to, to make these annual contributions that we're otherwise counting on coming from the investment funds. The same thing's true with the permanent fund. We're now we're, we're counting on the permanent fund generating earnings to help fund government and to, and to produce the PFD. If we take a portion of that and invest it into projects that don't produce earnings, are going to produce some other benefit. But don't produce earnings, then we're going to have to we're going to have to tax more, tax the citizens in the 2020s, 2030s, 2040s, 2050s more, uh, in order to come up with, in order in order to cover for those those lost earnings that would otherwise come out of the investment. So there's a big difference, big difference, between these investment funds that we're counting on to produce earnings, and 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 the, this managed economy we're trying to generate on the other side. Don't Hammond was right. Don't mix the two. Right. Keep the investment funds generated on producing earnings. Don't use them to try to manage the economy. The irony of this whole thing, Brad, is that this reminds me of one thing and really one thing only, and that is this centrally planned economy that we keep seeing in Lenin and, and a lot of these other things. The the parallels to that, to me, are the very definition of irony is that they're going to try and and quite honestly the hubris of politicians thinking that they know better than the than the free markets on how well things are going to work out that to me is just the most astonishing we've got track records of this we could see how centrally planned economies work and they don't that's the problem but that is the that is the uh, the the the, uh, the 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 lure that they keep dangling out in front of us, hoping that we'll bite bite at it, and especially on somebody who's supposedly on the GOP side that would uh, you know that would would pull for this. I, it just it astonishes me that this is what's going on. Yeah, I mean, relax regulations or target regulations or 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 provide incentives in terms of in terms of things that government otherwise might do in terms of terms of of local taxes or or things like that provide provide incentives in that way but don't use our investment funds that we're counting on to produce earnings uh and start using them to try to you know try to direct the economy absolutely if the private sector doesn't the private sector doesn't think those things are going to produce earnings then then we shouldn't we shouldn't be using our investment funds uh to get into them so top three, PFD, $3,000 plus. Hope that doesn't sting your wallet too much. Mark Begich is planned. He was for it before he's against it. Now he's shuffling off somewhere in the lower middle saying, well, you'll get a chunk of your PFD anyway. Walker, of course, continues to say you'll get almost nothing of it. And Mead Treadwell's pie in the sky. Hey, we should take all that money and spend it on all these wild projects that the private sector doesn't want to touch. That pretty much summates the top three for today. I need a drink. I knew it. I predicted it. I need a drink in a bad way. Uh, I'll give you a chance to summate here. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for a Sustainable Budget. Brad, go ahead. Well, this points out to me, Michael, going through these, this points out to me, don't look at candidates you like. Look to the policies that they're proposing. I mean, all of us have friends. I mean, a lot of people have said, I support Meade because Meade's a friend. I've been around him a long time. I've known him to be a good person. Yep, Meade's a great guy. Uh, there are state representatives, state representatives. There are state senators that are, that are great guys. Fun to go fishing with. Fun to be around talk a good game but look at the policies they're supporting look look at what they would do if they were in power uh and and base your vote base your support on the policies that they would put in place not their personalities i mean i i've got to be honest i like i like jennifer johnston a lot south anchorage rep uh personal personally she and I get along. We have the same music interests. 
I, I like her a lot. But she is she she's voted to cut the PFD. She voted to kick costs down the road with HB 311, and and has indicated along with Chris Birch that you know the PF the PFD is flexible. She can just keep it, it, she can just keep taking it on down. I I like Jennifer a lot. I'd love to be able to support Jennifer. I can't based on those policies, based upon what she's voted for. So yes, we all have friends out there. We all want to be supportive of people that you know we've been around in the past and have been good Republicans or we've been friends with. But look at their policies. Get down in the weeds, unfortunately, and look at their policies and look at the economic impact of what their policies are having on Alaska and, you know, in the case of the PFD, are having on your family. Um, that that's that's where you should judge your vote, not on whether you know the guy's fun to go fishing with. Absolutely. We need to be looking at this each and every one. I know you've got your endorsement list out there, Brad. Have you started filling in the blanks yet? Are you starting to endorse some candidates in the primary? We'll, uh, we'll, we're starting to go up with it today. We, we'll have a chunk of them today, and then uh, over the next couple of days, we'll fill in the rest of the list. Well, we've been going over all these candidates here on the show, and I'll tell you, it's a little disappointing to see some of these candidates come up and not have the answers uh, on some of these issues, uh, or at least not having thought through some of these issues. Um, and, and I think that's why you're going to get the best information on what's really going on with the budget when you tune into the program here with Brad Keithley on board. Uh, go out to his website, Alaskans for a Sustainable Budget. It's up on Facebook. The link is at the top of the, uh, of the Facebook video this morning. You could find it there. Brad, as always, this is amazing stuff. I really appreciate you being part of it. And uh, we, look forward to, uh, we look forward to seeing you here in the next week and see where things are going to be going from there. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube and SoundCloud pages and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week.